Good afternoon and welcome um, to everyone. It's, um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome um, the Deputy Minister for European Affairs of Estonia, uh, Mati Masikas, who is uh, on a uh, tour of a number of European capitals uh, currently, including our own, and he has had, and I think will continue to have this afternoon, uh, discussions with uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and, and its uh, leadership on European affairs. So we're very welcome to Dublin in, in that context, but we're very pleased that you've had time to come uh, to the Institute of uh, International European Affairs to update us on um, Estonia's view of the developments currently in the Union and particularly um, the ones pending in 2019, um, not least in the area of the future financing of the Union and also to some extent the institutional affairs of the Union we've touched in some of the preliminary discussion on the important uh, year that it is in terms of the, uh, the European Parliament elections and the way in which they will be uh, profiled and organised with the lead candidate idea and, and, and so on. Um, in speaking to these uh, topics, um, Deputy Minister Masikas brings an enormous amount of uh, knowledge and experience to bear. Um, he's uh, had a long career in the uh, foreign <coughs> affairs area, 25 years. He has been Deputy Minister for EU Affairs in Estonia since uh, 2016. Um, and as such, the Minister heads up the Interministerial Task Force on Brexit, where uh, I'm sure that his discussions in our own ministry, and what we've already discussed here today, uh, will have filled him in on the um, very um, predominant uh, concern here um, about that particular aspect of the development of the, uh, the Union and indeed of the financial perspectives given the, the hole that uh, British exit from the Union will leave in the, in the budget. Um, he's also the coordinator of the uh, first Estonian presidency of the, uh, of the Council of Ministers and in that regard, I think we should offer our congratulations on such a uh, successful Estonian presidency in such areas as um, the digital, obviously, and the Italian summit, which I think brought a political dimension to bear on the uh, somewhat, uh, sometimes very technical areas of um, creating and, and consolidating the digital single market, but also areas like uh, climate change, posted workers, and I think to uh, fisheries, which always comes round at the end of the year, more in the Corriper 1 side than the Corriper 2 side, but still an achievement of the, of the Presidency. Um, and of course, your, your time in Brussels as the permanent representative uh, to the EU from 2011 to 2016 is uh, obviously particularly valuable in informing the insights which you will be able to, uh, to give us um, in looking forward now to the, uh, to the MFF and um, other issues pending in in 2019. Um, can I ask you, as always, to turn your phones uh, either off or, or to silent before we begin? Uh, the Deputy Minister will speak for uh, about 15 or 20 minutes. That part of the exchanges will be on the record. And there'll be time for some question and answer um, afterwards, which, uh, to which the, the Chatham House rules of being off the record um, will apply. And could I just uh, add a word of thanks to Ambassador Carlson for helping us to put this event uh, together, and uh, one of a series of events uh, here involving Estonia, particularly the ones during the presidency, which are um, in an excellent way complementary to the growing um, and widening relationship uh, between Estonia and Ireland um, within, the, within the European Union. So the floor is yours, Deputy Minister. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, thanks uh, to you all for showing up. It's a great honor for me uh, to be here in speaking capacity. Um, I, was, I was brought twice to this institute uh, by two previously, by, by two outstanding Irish diplomats. Uh, first in 2006 by the um, uh, late Dermot Gallagher, 
mm-hmm. who was the secretary general of, of the ministry. Uh, and then for the second time in 2013 by, by Rory Montgomery, mm-hmm. uh, when we had our Corapet trip under the, under the Irish presidency, I never dared to think that I'd be, I'd be invited to speak uh, <laughs> uh, myself. <laughs> so thanks for, for, this, for this opportunity. Uh, the EU, as we all know, has uh, been developed and uh, has been developing in crisis, in various crises. <coughs> and um, <coughs> Repeatedly, uh, while experiencing uh, those crises of the recent years myself in Brussels, uh, I have been. I, I, I was thinking about about the previous crisis and people, leaders and diplomats who solved the previous crisis and thought, but did they, while while managing uh, those crises, did they think that oh, it's a good chance to manage this crisis and then to uh, develop the EU further? Or did they think of, oh my god, this whole thing will fall apart? Uh, I must say, I quite often, <laughs> during the Eurozone uh, or migration crisis or the Ukraine crisis, thought, oh my god, how, how will we manage this? Will this whole thing fall apart? So, so um, the EU, even as it is today, is shaped by, this, by the influence of three big crises. First, the Eurozone crisis. That, that showed us that some things that we thought that would be fundamental to stay there, like a common currency, is not forgiven. It's not, uh, uh, it's, uh, not it, uh, it's, it's vulnerable, it's imperfect. Then the migration crisis revealed that the EU is not equipped for, for managing operational crisis. The EU does not have, the EU is still, still pretty much a machinery of getting legislation adopted and then oh, I mean overseen and everything. But the EU does not have a headquarters. The EU does not have a general. I would say tomorrow a thousand border guards to this, to this area, uh, the day of tomorrow ten thousand blankets to that, uh, to that uh, refugee camp and, and so on. Uh, and <coughs> the EU is facing and may face even more acute crisis, operational crisis, than, than the migration crisis was. And this is a deficiency that we still have. And third, the Brexit that, that proved, uh, that showed the impossible, or that was thought impossible. Yes, a member state can leave the Union. Uh, the EU integration is reversible. That can, under certain circumstances, be reversible. And of course, the Brexit change is uh, quite a few balances within the within the union. None of these three crises are completely solved. And Brexit, as you as you well know, in this country, is is is, is underway. And the the uh, this crisis still affects many many things uh, that the that the EU needs to do and the EU, the atmosphere and circumstances that the EU is operating. On Eurozone, there have always been and still are two schools. Um, first, the first school saying, uh, well, we did manage, didn't we? So no need for major changes in the, in the Eurozone architecture. And the second school saying, we barely survived. So we, need to be <laughs> we need to prepare ourselves for the next crisis. Some changes need to be, need to be done. Um, the former school is obviously quite obvi- obviously winning. There has been some talks and even some letters about about nice to haves and need to haves in the eurozone reform. Um, for me, the completion of the banking union is a need to have. That's a that's a political promise that we gave back in 2012. Uh, it's not completed. There are elements that are missing, and the the purpose of the banking union was to is to break the vicious link between banks and, and sovereigns and this this work is badly underway only the next eurozone crisis if and when it will come will show which school was right uh, and i'm not sure i i i want to find this out <laughs> at that acute 
<laughs> on migration, yes, the EU has bored ourselves um, uh, some time with the Turkey arrangement and some other things like the like the strengthened EU border and coast guard, and 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 we are still working on the reforming of the of the common uh, common asylum um, rules. But the migration crisis shows that what. Whereas during the Eurozone crisis, uh, all, all the member states' objectives were, were pretty much the same, to preserve, to keep the, uh, keep the, the uh, common currency alive. Uh, migration crisis was, was much more volatile crisis. And, and member states, you would, you would be having uh, frontline member states, transition countries, destination countries, countries like my own, where the crisis was felt because there was... Uh, and, uh, b because there was crisis in Brussels, uh, so so and and consequently the member states' interests <coughs> were different, and consequently the uh, the um, mutual understanding and atmosphere soured badly, and this uh, and this issue of solidarity was brought upon in a quite different way than, than previously, and it it. Uh, affects the atmosphere and the mood in the EU among member states uh, even today and it will have its implications also on the discussions on the next multi-annual budget of the, of the EU. On, on Brexit, I don't, here in Dublin, I don't need to explain how badly underway this, this, uh, this process. Uh, this crisis uh, have, have, as I said, soured the mood. Uh, in the in the EU, not only I don't I don't I don't mean the governments, the diplomats in Brussels, um, also have has had a direct effect on on the public opinions. I mean, for decades, EU has has by and large meant positive, good things for for, for people, money, investments. Uh, support for farmers, possibilities to work abroad, study and everything. Suddenly, with the Eurozone crisis, in some member states, the EU meant uh, laying off people, cutting wages, cutting pensions, uh, uh, very unpopular privatization, uh, and so on. And thus, it, it, it has, it, has uh, it, 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 it did have big impact on public opinion and thus on the legitimacy and support for the EU and the, uh, and the legitimacy of the, of the EU. Uh, yes, after the Brexit vote in all, the, in all 27 member states, the support for the EU, public support for the EU uh, increased, but I don't want to, uh, I don't want to answer or to guess whether it was out of love or, or out of fear. Um, this means uh, this wobbling of the support to the EU and this somewhat soured atmosphere means that for the for the next couple of years, I don't see new big integration steps that would be in the cards. New big integration steps or institutional changes would need treaty cha would take treaty change. That uh, next time round would probably mean a referendum more than in one member state. And since the outbreak of the Eurozone crisis, the, the heads of state and government in the European Council have not been willing to take this risk, and, and to my mind, quite right. At the same time, while managing this crisis, big integration steps were taken. Under the, under the economic governance system, uh, member states, Eurozone member states are, are now obliged to present the draft national budgets to the European Commission even before they pass it to their own parliament. If you look, if you read carefully the para, para 19 of the, of the European Border and Coast Guard Regulation, you may find, you may find uh, issues there uh, with, <coughs> with men and women in uniform uh, on, on, a, on a territory on the territory of a, of a sovereign country in some, in some uh, circumstances. But we have not been having a, a big political, low political discussion about these, about these things. There were things that needed to be done, and on that one, the EU has been, 
has been proven to be quite resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the EU, if, if, if there's a real crisis, the EU needs, it's, it gets its act together and, and does things, but, um, but not in a way that we used to in the um, previously uh, with the treaty changes, conventions, and, and all the, all the uh, political talk around this. So, so uh, in a certain uh, paradoxical way, um, integration has happened and is happening uh, not in rhetorics but by necessity. Uh, in the field of single market, inter integration is, is happening even, even under its own weight. <laughs> there are so massive rules uh, that need to be updated anyway, so integration Integration is happening. Data protection regulation is a good good case in point. The previous one dated in 1995. No digital element there. Now you now you have the new new general general directive um, in uh, in place. And this paradoxical situation, of course, carries carries big political risks. And we have seen, not least in the UK, we have seen what. Uh, the risks that are there if things, uh, the EU-related things in that context, are not being discussed openly. Um, uh, it carries, carries huge political risks. So, risks. so the political elites, the political leaderships in, our, in, in all member states uh, must find the, the courage to explain the importance of EU membership, its positive action uh, aspects. And they need to do it with the same conviction or, or passion as the, as the opponents do. So, so we, we all need to have need to need to have the courage to make the positive case for the for the EU. In these circumstances, in this overall, to my mind, there are four big areas where the EU has to intellectually and politically to to have answers to make up its mind or choose its path. The first is, op uh, is the choice between being open and being protectionist. Trade policy is a case in point. Each and every, each and every uh, next uh, trade agreement uh, is, is, uh, is harder to push through uh, in, the, in the EU. But it's, uh, it would be, I think, intellectually and politically uh, not uh, fully possible to be protectionist outside and very integrationist, very open inside. Okay. Let's protect our people from the impacts of foreign trade, but let's tear down all the barriers in the single market. <coughs> that does not fit together, unfortunately. If you need, you, you need to protect things, you, you protect them um, 360 degrees. Mm. So, so, um, and that's, uh, I mean, that's in the times that a single market badly needs to be developed further, especially in the field of services. Services make up 70% of the EU economy, but only 20% of cross-border trade within the, within the EU. Um, and uh, not many people, not many governments are pushing for, for the liberalizing services uh, within the single market, and that's a big, that's uh, that's a, that's a huge pity, but it's also no no coincidence, unfortunately. The second second area is the east-west divide that is again visible in the EU. Uh, uh, we are under time constraints. I recommend you all reading Ivan Krestov's the the. Uh, Bulgarian thinker, think tanker's latest book from last year, After Europe. Uh, here he eloquently uh, lists the reasons why countries in the Eastern Europe uh, have sometimes, in some aspects, different attitudes, different policies towards, towards uh, immigration than, than their counterparts in the Western Europe. Um, but uh, but uh, here today, when I speak of of the of the uh, issues between the eastern and western part of of our of our union, um, mm, it's it's about the balance between social Europe 
and between further developing the single market, we are, we are in this phase that social Europe issues are more prominently there. Uh, but, but to counterbalance that with further opening up possibilities to compete on a, on a harmonized market is, is, is not true. The Estonian presidency, as you, as you noticed, uh, did duly its part uh, also uh, for the, uh, under, the, under the social Europe files. We closed the, the social proclamation, social rights proclamation was, was adopted um, and, and the, um, and the posted workers directive uh, was uh, was adopted, but somehow I have this feeling that this 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 in this equation things are a bit unbalanced. Um, the east-west constellation is also very visible in the next area of concern. The EU was was created, and the EU has long been successful. These successful. <coughs> In dealing, in dealing with the issues between its member states. I mean, the EU was created so that the European countries would not go to war against each, each other anymore. And the Nobel Peace Prize from 2012 is a, is a proof of our, of our success in that. Um, since the Eurozone crisis, at the latest, the EU has to, has to deal more and more with the issues inside member states. Uh, during the Eurozone crisis, we, we learned about each other domestic politics much more than we previously had, and maybe probably much more than we wanted to. <laughs> um, some developments in some member states or a threat of these developments in other member states uh, has caused quite a concern in others. Um, and the uh, intense uh, wide media coverage helps here, uh, helps this as well. I could not have uh, thought that the elections in a country-sized Hungary, the previous elections would have gotten previously such a, such a large media coverage than, than they did this, this time around. It was all over the, all over the, the European, the, in European media. It used to be, it used to be different back then. Um, the launch of, by the European Commission of the Article 7 procedure on the state of the rule of law in Poland has, has brought back some issues of the impact of the fifth enlargement. We, I feel that very clearly. We feel that very clearly. Has the EU become too diverse? We know our own Estonian experience that that in, in democracy, in building up democracy, in, in, in making democracy function, traditions matter. Traditions come with time. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the EU will probably have to deal with issues inside member states more broadly than just oversight of the common rules in the, in the, near, in the near future. And again, the EU is not well equipped for that. I mean, to, to bring up issues in a club, where it's, a, it's a club of voluntary that members, distinguished members that all have joined voluntarily and, and have pooled some sovereignty. In this kind of club, uh, you sit with 28 at the table, it's extremely difficult to, to start to talk of one member's possible, possible shortcomings. But, but ways need to be found. And this will be, to me, this will be the litmus test for, for the Union of Ours for the, for the next couple of years. And yes, these issues are already affecting the talks about the next EU budget. So it, has, it has very concrete, particular, particular implication. Uh, it needs to be done in a, in, a, in a realistic way and in a sensible way and discreet way. Brussels, the EU institutions, cannot risk breeding even more tension in the, in the EU. In particular, the, the European Commission and the European Parliament have to, have to listen, listen to the national concerns with a, with a very sensitive ear. And fourthly and finally uh, is the global dimension. I prefer to call the choice between the short-term and long-term approach in, 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 in the EU's foreign policy. Uh, for me, the only way to, to, to protect the EU's achievements is to 
is to be a real global player. <coughs> there are many things that we have achieved are on the global, or on the influence from, from global actors or, or trends. Uh, but then the <laughs> if you don't have gunboats, the success of your foreign policy is measured against how, how do you manage the relations with your neighbors. I mean, uh, uh, quite often you hear in Brussels this, we need to face China. You're right. But I think, I think the, the, um, those big players in the, in, on the global scene who assess EU's foreign policy will first look uh, of course, trade policy and trade agreements are important. They will first look on how we are how we are stabilizing our neighborhood, how we are using and projecting our soft power because we have we, we haven't any hard power, really, as a as a union. Our enlargement policy is, is probably not working precisely as it as it should be. Um, we will, we will. We are massively uh, financing, or we are massively transferring money to enlargement countries, but not in all of them we get the return in terms of uh, EU-related reforms. And the and the uh, situation is is even worse with the with the neighbourhood policy countries. I mean, in particular, in the eastern neighbourhood or the, in the eastern partnership countries. There are European states who are wanting and striving to reform their societies uh, according to the European model. They want to become European. In that sense, uh, believe me, the EU has already won. In terms of soft power in the, in the most of the Eastern partnership countries, the EU's model is att attractive. <coughs> EU soft power has already won. Uh, and, and, um, I mean, if um, um, and we we could or we should make a better use of this of of this attraction of ours uh, in order to in order to project stability to stabilize our our neighbourhood. We will we will only the EU will only become a real foreign policy player until we get these fundamentals right. So. The EU will become fit to face the challenges of our time only when uh, we have responses to the choices that I list between being open and protectionist, rebalancing the social pillar with deepening of the single market, in, pa in particular in the field of services, easing the tensions between member states, wealthier and less wealthy, with different lengths of democratic experience, Find ways on how to ensure uh, following of the common values and rules in a way that preserves the integrity of our union. And finally, when we have a long-term view on, on global foreign policy affairs. Thank you.